Welcome to note set number three for signals and systems. Uh, today we're going to, or in this video, we're going to talk about discrete time signals. So we'll cover pretty much the same ground we just did for continuous time signals. Uh, so most of the processing that's done today is done using uh, digital technology or discrete time systems. Um, because we're using computer technology and computers can't take in a continuous time signal because they must operate on a discrete set of numbers and I don't care how short you make your interval the number of points in any interval of a continuous time signal is infinite uh, and continuously infinite um, so discrete time signals allow us to take information and put them inside our computer. Um, so that's why we need to talk about them. So here's the scenario that we've already seen. Um, you start off with a continuous time signal goes through a sensor, through some analog electronics, which itself is a continuous time system. Then we go through an A to D converter, an ADC, and we get a discrete time signal, which we then bring into our computer and we process it there. Um, and we end up with an electrical discrete time signal and um, then we may re, you know, convert that back into a continuous time signal if so desired but we don't always have to do that. So a continuous time signal is just a function on the real line. A discrete time signal is just a um, function on the integers. So um, we denote it x of n and if you're uh, observant you'll see that um, we use square brackets for a discrete time function and we use parentheses for a continuous time function. Um, it just helps us keep track of what is what. And the n value here goes over the integers minus whatever all the way through zero up to one, two, three, four, and on to infinity, but on a discrete set, not a continuous set. So to visualize these, instead of drawing straight lines, which would indicate that there's points at every value in between, um, we use what's called a stem plot. Um, and uh, we just draw a little dot uh, with a, a vertical stem. The vertical stem is not part of the uh, value it just helps us visualize it and there, the important thing is that there is nothing in between so it's not like we're saying that it takes on the value of zero between it doesn't it takes on nothing there are no values there um, now sometimes we violate this idea of a stem plot and we do plot with connections between uh, we do that mostly um, when we're trying to relate these values back to a continuous time signal from which the, they came as samples and we'll get into that more as we go along. So the important thing to remember is that for discrete time processing uh, we need discrete time signals uh, that can be brought into a computer and allow us to do the processing. Um, so here's the connection between some continuous time signal. Um, so we, we've got some signal x of t, um, it gets converted into y of t through some maybe RLC circuit with some op amps maybe. Um, and so that signal is here, here. So, um, so this is y of t here. Um, and then the a to d converter uh, just takes samples of, of that thing and uh, um, that's what shows up here. So you can see that uh, this discrete time signal is nothing more than the samples of that. So here it's a function of t, here it's a function of n, and n is equal to just the integers. But remember we can always tie those integers back to the actual time point. The integer 2 here corresponds to 2t, and here capital T we used it previously for the period, but now we're going to press it into a second duty um, and, and use it as the sampling interval. It's the time spacing between when we take samples 
of our continuous time signal. So this idea of sampling a continuous time signal, uh, you, you benefit from this at virtually every day. You talk into your cell phone, your voice gets sampled like this. You are listening on your iPod or MP3 player, you're listening to the, the result of taking a continuous time signal, something that went into a microphone as a continuous time signal, and ultimately gets sampled so that it can be stored in your computer. In an MP3 format, uh, which has got a lot of signal processing involved in it, um, and the intent there is to just make it be able to be stored efficiently. But fundamentally, before you actually listen to it, it has to get converted back into a, a true discrete time signal, not an MP3 file format, but into a, just a sequence of actual samples, and then ultimately reconvert it into a continuous time signal so that you can hear it in your uh, crappy little earbuds. So we need a mathematical expression for this act of sampling. Well, it's very easy. The sample at index n is just the time function. Notice the square brackets versus parentheses. So it's just the time function evaluated at t equal to nt. And it's easier to write it this way. So we have this connection here. Um, capital T is the sampling interval. And the reciprocal of that. Um, which is in the units of samples per second. That's a rate. How fast am I taking the samples? How many samples per second? Um, and there's a reason that we use this symbol um, F, and we'll learn more about that later in the course. Um, now you may be aware that um, the audio that you listen to on a CD is, and, and therefore most MP3 files um, it is a signal that was sampled at 44,100 samples per second. So that's roughly a sample every 22.68 microseconds. So those samples are happening pretty fast. Um, now, uh, one question we should ask is, um, why is it sampled at that rate? What would happen if I sampled it slower? Because if I sampled it slower, then for a given length of song, I'd have less data to store, and that would be good. Um, <clears throat> so there must be a reason that we're sampling it that fast. And there is. If we sample a signal too slow, um, we won't get an accurate um, an accurate representation of it. It'd be sort of like trying to measure the bottom of a of a river by taking um, measurements at at uh, you know maybe every ten meters. Um, is every ten meters good enough? Maybe you need to go every meter. I, it depends on um, how fast the bottom of the river is going to change. So uh, fortunately, there is an easy way, quote unquote, easy way to answer this question. Um, but we'll have to wait until later when we cover Fourier transforms to get the answer to that. Um, but here's a hint. Uh, we're sampling at 44,000 samples per second. And we know that humans can hear up to about 20,000 hertz. Um, and it's no coincidence that um, our sample rate is tw about twice, a little more than twice, um, the highest frequency that we can hear. But we'll prove mathematically later why that's a good relationship. Now, um, we've been talking about discrete time signals. Let me back up just a second here, um, where the actual um, or the actual value here um, is exactly equal to whatever the voltage was at that instant of time. Um, in practice, an A to D converter does something else. Um, it can only represent a finite number of possible values. Um, so if you have a, a say, a 16-bit A to D converter, um, you can only represent 2 to the 16 different possible voltage values. So basically, you look at what the voltage really is, and you round it to the closest value of those 2 to the 16th that you have available to you. Um, so we're not going to fuss with that at all. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of skip over this a little bit, but this just 
shows that um, you know if, if your uh, maximum voltage is V and, it's, and um, you have a signal that's going say from plus V to minus V so the total range is 2V and the total number of possible values is 2 to the B uh, then um, this is the spacing between those possible values to enable you to cover that range um, and you can see that as B gets bigger, that spacing is closer together. Um, so that's a, a more accurate representation. So this is called quantization, and we're going to ignore completely its effects. Um, so just like we did for continuous time signals, we'll look at some common discrete time signals. Um, and much of what we saw uh, earlier carries over. Uh, so we have the discrete time unit step. I'm not going to bore you. It's it's pretty much the same. We have the discrete time unit ramp. Again, pretty much the same. So those two are, are virtually identical to what we've seen, but there are some differences. So we had the discrete or we had the continuous time impulse or the delta function um, that was infinitesimally narrow and infinitely high, but still had unit area. Um, for discrete time, we have to define our impulse a little bit different. Um, so it's, it's zero out here everywhere. So those dot, dot, dots mean those zeros continue on. And then it goes to one um, at the origin. So mathematically, we would say it like that. Now, it's important to remember that if I were to take a delta of t, ha, notice I screwed up there. Those should be parentheses. If I took a delta of t and just sampled it, um, I would not get the delta of n. So um, fortunately, delta of t doesn't really exist in the real world. Um, so this is only a theoretical issue and, and, and doesn't really cause us any real heartburn. So we had the sifting property for the continuous time delta function. Um, the, for the discrete time, it works exactly the same way, except instead of being inside integrals, it's inside a summation. So um, we have this property um, that holds for the uh, discrete time. We have this property that holds for continuous time. Um, this was the continuous time sifting property. This is its corresponding version in discrete time. And you can see that everything pretty much follows exactly the same way. Now we had rectangular pulse before. We're going to define this a little bit differently than for continuous time. Uh, if you remember, for continuous time we had um, p sub tau of t, and tau defined the width. For discrete time, uh, just because uh, of, a, of a little uh, idiosyncrasy in the discrete time world, instead here we're going to let the subscript q um, correspond to the extent in both directions. So um, so the, the total number of samples would be 2q plus 1 ranging from minus q up to q. So that's that's really the only only distinction here. We have discrete time sinusoids. Um, we didn't really talk about continuous time sinusoids. We'll get to those in a little bit. Uh, not this lecture, but uh, another one coming up. Uh, but we'll talk about discrete time ones here. Um, so uh, very much like what you've seen for continuous time in previous courses, but we use this uppercase omega, uh, so that's an uppercase omega, to represent the frequency of discrete time sinusoids. So the question is, what is the unit for that frequency? Uh, and also, by the way, we have um, the phase, theta, and the amplitude, a. Um, so the question is, what should be the unit for omega. Um, well, we know, maybe you don't know, but listen up, this is the rule. Anything that goes inside cosine must be in radians. I don't care, I know you've seen it in books, cosine of 35 degrees, um, that's just notational um, BS. Cosine operates on radians. That's its mathematical definition. Um, before you plug it into the function, you have to convert the degrees into radians. Yes, I know your calculator will take it, um, but your calculator is really first converting it into radians 
and then doing the computation. So our rule is anything inside a cosine or a sine or a tangent must be in radians. So this thing must be in radians. That must mean that means theta itself must be in radians, but more importantly to answer our question, omega times n must be in radians. So omega is the amount of radians that this angle changes in each sample. So omega's units are radians, I'll go away, radians per sample. So pretty straightforward. Now you may be familiar with the frequency of continuous time sinusoids being in radians per second. There it's a rate at which the angle is changing. Here it's how much, how, it's still a rate, but it's a discrete rate. How many radians does it change for each sample change? Um, so we'll stop there for this video, um, and uh, you know most of the other issues um, for discrete time sinusoids are pretty much like continuous time sinusoids. So we'll stop there. Thanks.